<laughs> Welcome back to the No Boring Stories podcast. We are going to have some fun today. I've got a very good friend here on the show. It is Paige Lawrence Champion, and we are going to talk about all things, I don't know, great storytelling, Olympics. We might get into small horses. I don't know. We'll see where this goes. <laughs> Paige, how are you doing today? I'm good. We're like two farts in the wind. <laughs> or forgotten easily? What is that? <laughs> no, we go wherever the wind blows. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> S- smelled for a moment, but then let go. That's what that's what I thought. But, uh, okay. Smelled for a moment, remembered for eternity. <laughs> that's, that is, <laughs> we should get that tattooed. Uh, look, we got to... This is going to be 30 minutes of laughter and 10 minutes of conversation. And, and I'm here for it. And I, obviously that's what I'm bringing to this. We got to (laughs) start with uh, a story. You told me one of the best stories that you've ever heard is very specific. You love your dad as a storyteller Mm -hmm. and you've learned some advice from him or some experience about how to tell stories (laughs) from him. And you have a story. You don't need to tell me the whole details of the story and pretend to be him, but I just, just fill me in a little bit like this story that you have that you remember about a yak. What have you got? Yeah. Yeah. So my dad is like, I feel like the best storyteller because he just gets so in the moment. He's like a kid telling a funny story. He laughs at his own jokes. Yeah. Um, and for the first good chunk of his life, he was a professional bull rider. So he rodeoed and he has this one story about how he drove down to the States, we're Canadian, um, as a youngster to enter this rodeo. And it ended up being not a rodeo. It was um, a yak riding competition. Um, So a yak is quite different than a bull. (laughs) Um, And just the way way that he goes into like the entire story, you're just like peeing your pants laughing the entire time so okay so (laughs) i imagine there's this great moment right where you're like packing the family up i'm doing this thing there's a big opportunity we're going i he's practicing i don't know what rodeo i mean you do know how a rodeo rider practices and does all that stuff um but so you're doing this and then you get there and you see this large hairy yak instead of yeah something with horns like is it just like that's the climax moment is and he just goes like what the climax i mean e- e- yes really and it's just like the way that he tells it like he, he his own disbelief at the moment is still present throughout the entire story um and it's, it's really just kind of like an absurd story like never i want to know what a yak riding competition is is that well, the same thing? Or are they trying to buck the rider off? Like same? Yeah, yeah. It's like ride the yacht. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty self-explanatory. Well, okay, I think. <laughs> okay. We laugh at that. That's ridiculous. It should be riding a bull. But at some point, that was a stupid idea, wasn't it? <laughs> at some point, yeah. somebody was like, these things are crazy. <laughs> What well, if we strapped a rope to it and tried to hold on as long as possible and then made a, a massive I mean, industry about this, a sport? Yeah, what I'm hearing you say is that if yak riding ever gets popular, it's credit goes to my dad. Obviously, yeah, he yeah. was a pioneer. <clears throat> pioneer. In, in the sport. Before his time, one could say. Did he win? I don't even remember that part of the story. Like, I just Isn't remember- so good? laughing at the entire ridiculousness of it that okay so that's the beautiful part here I think that's what I would take away from this is great you know the story you can go into it we don't know it but in just even in that answer the question did he win it doesn't matter actually (laughs) that end result that end of the rainbow that sort of you know oh how did like was it a happy end it it doesn't matter because the the story itself was so good whatever build up that that the fact that he won or lost was a moot point. Um, totally. And again, that's the power of a good storyteller, right? Yes. Like, I don't even remember like if he won or not. You're right. But that's not the point. The point is he had me so involved in the story that I'm like, that experience of hearing the story was the best. Yeah. Okay. And then you get, and then you gave me this, this advice that, that 
you learned from him about <laughs> kind of adding a little fluff to the story. <laughs> Tell me about this. Yeah. So again, cowboys are famous for their re-ride stories, which is like, <laughs> they just sit around and have a couple drinks, maybe like around a fire or a table, really anywhere. And they live out their younger days. And the advice is never let a little lie get in the way of a good story or never let a little bullshit get in the way of mm -hmm. a good story, which just means that, you know, if you got to add a little extra here and there for like yeah. the sake of a laugh or to like involve the crowd more, like go for it. You know, this yes. is showmanship. Um, it's so good. I think that my wife and I had this conversation early on when like when I was a youth pastor and stuff and I'm getting on stage or like, you know, you're, you're hearing speakers all the time and we're like, yeah, but did it really happen like that? And, mm -hmm. and she would often say something like that. Like, I don't, I don't think it happened. It's like, it doesn't matter if it happened like that. It simply doesn't matter because we remember it. It's there. It's stuck. And it's such a small detail yeah. unless, totally. unless it is the end result that, yeah like the the thing that that everyone's gonna like hang the hat on like that in that case again the, <laughs> there's there's got to be a limit to the little lie but yeah um, you don't want to challenge the integrity of the story it's just meant as flourishes come on and I think that my dad was so very similar in that uh mm -hmm. as I hear this I don't know I mean it's at this point where his stories were so bizarre he traveled the world <laughs> as a photographer and he, he could have been telling, he could have been making it up the whole time, the oh, whole time. But then I remember when he was, when he was dying, he was on his, you know, he's close to the end and kind of just suffering all this kind of like memory loss, almost like dementia symptoms. And, and a nurse said to me one day, they're like, yeah, he's not doing well. He keeps like, you know, going in and out and he's making up stories about being in Sweden with ballet dancers and, and something. I was like, oh, nope, That's not real. made up. He's reliving his life. That's what Aww. he's doing. He's just telling you about his crazy life. Uh, <laughs> so that's and they're what like, we realize. Oh, like, this... yeah, his brain is actually doing quite well. He's okay. <laughs> but these oh, thoughts, that's they really thought cool. he was going cool. nuts. So <laughs> there you go. Take the stories wherever you want to. And, uh, and people might just think you're crazy. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> Great. You are, uh, you, I mean, you've got great examples around you. Uh, it is so great to listen to you tell your own stories about your life. And so we want to get into it for sure and, and open up, um, you know, the journey that you've been on. So let's just start here, Paige, and get to know you now a little bit. What is the main work that you're bringing to the world now? Uh, what are you doing? And what's the impact that you're seeing now? Yeah, so I call myself a high performance coach for entrepreneurs and small business owners. Um, I bring really my focus is on helping entrepreneurs, these like passion driven, ambitious, high achieving people really get clear on their own definition of success. Cause I feel like it's really easy to get sucked into the rat race of what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, I help them really take clear, concise, intentional action towards creating that. So it's like that dream bigger, get clear on what's fulfilling to you. And then yeah. I help them show up every day and just do the hard work in a way that okay. they Okay. So when somebody is sitting here saying like, oh my goodness, that is just so not me. Like I'm not that show up and do the hard work. I'm not that intentional action kind of person. I go with the flow, but I'm also kind of frustrated with where life is at right now. So if somebody comes in and helps you kind of with, or you help them with that, the intentional action, the goals, the, the getting there, uh, then what, uh, like, who are they after that? They're more confident. I would say that's like a big piece of it. They're just like more confident in their own authentic journey. They're hmm more clear and prepared on what they want to go and do and how they want to do it. They are secure in their ability to execute. Um, and they really just like own their inner power. They own their vision moving forward. They mm. own how they're showing up and doing the work. Um, and those are kind of, I feel like those three peak pillars of performance, preparation, execution, ownership. Um, and I feel like with those three things, you're pretty much an unstoppable force. So, okay. So you said confidence. Maybe that's here, it. They become here. unstoppable. Ooh. 
You want to write that down? <laughs> I'll listen to the podcast and I'll write you, it down after. You said confident, secure, and ownership. And then you and then you kind of switch that performance execution or preparation execution Pre- preparation. ownership. Yeah, so those confidence. Are the, those are, confidence is the ownership. Confidence yeah, okay. is like, but ownership is like that, like unshakable. It's bigger than confident. It's mm. like, I know who I am. I know what I'm going after. And you can't take, like, I feel like on the journey from wanting it to achieving it, it being success, whatever that may be for you, yeah. there will be a million shining red blinking exit signs. There'll be a million reasons for you to quit or give up or to go a different route. And when you have ownership of your own vision and, and ownership of yourself, you don't need the exercise because you're just so secure on like your why and why you're doing moving forwards. Uh-huh. So unstoppable, unshakable. Yeah. Ownership. Where does that, that idea, can we land on ownership or would you want unshakable? Like which one it describes you the best right now? Oh gosh. How you feel. You pick a word that resonates with you because they all resonate with me. They all feel like a piece of the puzzle. So it's all the same thing for you. Those all sort of resonate around the same thing. That's what I would say. Let's zone that in on, on what's one that you would say, this is, this is the, the word that I would want people to know me for, to know that this is how I feel right now. This is how I show up in a room. Okay. Then let's go with unstoppable. I think that is the takeaway. Okay. So where does that begin for you? Where does that begin? Yeah. So go back, go back now in your story early on, wee little page, wee little page. And there's this idea of, I will not be stopped or I don't want to be stopped. I don't want to be distracted. Like, what is it that shows up? Where does that idea of, I can do this and nothing will stop me begin? Yeah. Uh, It's a, I mean, it's a long story. It began in 1990. It was a cold winter day. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> there were yaks walking around. I don't know what. <laughs> no, it, it is. It's, it's accumulation of my entire life that's got me to this point that has me wanting to take this stance in the world. But I think that the beginning of that, what fostered that fire, um, I was a young kid and I fell in love with figure skating. And mm-hmm. I grew up in a teensy tiny town. There was like 200 people. There's more cows around than humans. And I just started skating because I loved it. And I was quite recreational and very mediocre, but I was the best skater in my club, which is not saying a lot. Like I could like, yeah, it's not saying a lot. And I went to a summer skating camp because my older brother got to go to a hockey skating camp. So it was fair. And I remember being surrounded by girls both older and younger than me who are a lot better than me. Mm -hmm. And that didn't sit well with little nine-year-old Paige. She was like, what? No way. Uh, And it kind of kicked into this like competitive drive of mine. And I, I was the first person on the ice, last person off the ice. I had skates that were too big and my feet were bleeding and covered in blisters. And I just didn't care because I was so so committed. When you're at that stage as, okay. So me as a parent right now, I think of if my nine-year-old, like, are you driving that conversation with your parents or are they like, are they like, you got to work hard, you got to do this. And so you just absorbed that or were you bucking against their, their wishes for you as they see your feet bleeding? Yeah. I don't remember to be completely honest. I just remember like wanting to be the first person on the ice. It was the first time that I had a good coach or a, a better coach. I just remember like that, the drive. And then after that, um, my parents saw that I clearly liked it and was willing to work hard. Mm -hmm. And so they found a coach in a neighboring town about 25 minutes from my place, our our house, our ranch. And they gave me the option. They said, hey, you can stay recreational and skate in your hometown or we could go to this place and, you know, you'll get better coaching, all that stuff. And I was like, 100%, no question. I want to go. Wow. But that was when the accountability came in because they're like, if we're going to do this, right. like we're happy to, but you're going to work hard. Like you're going to take advantage of the opportunity. And it was a, it was a very serious conversation for like a nine-year-old to have. Mm-hmm. And then they held me accountable to it in the nicest, kindest way. But they fostered, for me, I call it like an understanding of the value of hard work and the value of, of 
living up to my commitment and recognizing that when I didn't work hard or I didn't show up for myself, Mm -hmm. I wasn't letting them down. I was letting myself down, which I think. So what was the value that they were instilling that the value of hard work is what, what is that inherent value? That it's, that's what means things, right? You said, you say you're going to do something and then you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, and it really just taught me that when I achieved these, like, you know, small milestone moments as a kiddo, like, Oh my gosh, I landed an axle. That's because I showed up for that goal because I made the commitment and because I did the work. Mm. Um, and I think that they just wanted me to see, like, again, they had no aspirations of me going to the Olympics. And I, I think that if anyone saw me skating back then, they would not have guessed that I'd go to the Olympics. I was like a bull in a China shop out there. I <laughs> fell more times than I stood on my feet. A yak um, in a China shop. But, you know, they, they taught me a yak and a, correct, correct. Yeah, excuse me. Um, <laughs> They, it just allowed me to get to know my own self-worth a little bit through making commitments, showing up for myself, doing the work and feeling the fulfillment of those Mm -hmm. like little wins. Um, So this is what's so fascinating to me when, when people have a story like this, where they're like, no, of course there was this significant moment that happened, you know, before I was 10 years old, this decision that I had to make, or this, this focus (laughs) that I had. And for you in this story, like what is Again, do you, do, yeah, do you have the forethought at that point? You know, go back and, and, and your best guess, but where did that idea of what was driving you? Was it simply that I, I can do better and I will do better, therefore I'm going to try harder? But was there a goal that you were working towards right off the bat? Or where did that develop for you into here's where I'm going with this? Yeah, my coach is a key factor. She, her like mentality was, I don't care what the, what my skaters goals are, like whether it be the Olympics or whether it be getting their junior bronze, which is very entry level. Her, her goal was always to help each skater develop to be the best that they could be. And she brought that to the ice every day, that expectation, um, that push. And so I think that also helped open my, my mind up to seeing, wow, like, I just want to get better. I want to see what my best is. Um, and so like at that early age, it was really just to be the best. I wanted to like be the best at every level. And then it was like, I wanted to be the best in Saskatchewan. And then it was like, I want to go to nationals. It was always just, oh, I reached this new next level. Mm -hmm. Great. What's the next one? Right. What's the difference between that measurement of best? I'm the best in Saskatchewan and I'm the best that I can be. Do you know what I mean? There's a, there's a, there's a measurement against others and a measurement against yourself there. And how does that how did that work together? I mean, I think it's one of the best things that I learned from sport is that it's okay to compete against others. That's like yeah. motivation, it's external fire. And in the process, I could be the best in Saskatchewan and not have my best performance. Like there was times I won competitions or I was disappointed in myself. Right. And there was times that I lost competitions where I was so proud of how I showed up. And so for me, that's, that's one of the things I bring to my coaching now is helping people to realize there's goals external to yourself and there's goals internal to yourself. And they go together really quite beautifully to feel, again, it's that ownership, to feel unstoppable, yeah. recognizing the controlling of which of those two things you're focusing on. Um, Do you think, okay, and let's go a little bit more into that. I'm thinking that the external goals are a lot easier to define and discover and and see then the internal goals are there are probably people out there many people uh living their lives according to external goals only mm-hmm. trying to reach that and then feel empty inside would you agree with that yes is it do you th- is there the opposite are there people is it possible and what would it require for somebody to live based only on internal goal. It's only, only myself that matters. Like only my ideas. Matter. Yeah. I, I honestly can't speak to that because I've never experienced it. I would say that like, it's a big world. So probably there's someone out there that sure. managed to capture that, whether that's for better or for worse, because I feel like it's a little bit of that yin and yang. I think that they're, they're not dueling forces. They're dancing forces. They work together to help mm-hmm. promote everyone to continuing to up level. Man, that was mm. beautiful, eh? Poetry. Yeah, 
Well, but this is the point that I, I think what I hear about that, yeah, as you say, they have to work together and either one on its own. It sounds like, no, live by yourself, like live internal, live, live by your own guiding force. But what that does is it, it creates this, this naval focused life, this, this, in, you're only looking in, you're looking at your own, you know, your own gut alone. And you forget that there are other people out there. Yeah. And, and to, to work both of them, to dance with both the internal and external really is what drives you to say like, okay, who am I? What's my worth? Like discover that and develop that on your own, which you are doing at this point and discovering the value of hard work and what you're capable of. And then bring that out to the world and say, well, how can I impact the world around me with that new discovery? Yeah. And then according to what I see and experience out there, how does that shape what I know about myself? And it's this back and forth. Yeah, I, I definitely, I definitely agree with all of that. And I also think in, in essence, it's also simpler. It's what do I want to accomplish and what do I want to achieve? And the, yeah. like, I call them performance goals, the focusing on myself. How do I want to show up in pursuit of them? Those are my controllables. How would I act if I were to hit, you know, that million dollar year? How, who would I be, have to be? How would I be behaving? Mm -hmm. What actions would I be taking? And so it puts the focus back on you rather than focusing on a goal that's external to you that often has a lot of external factors and a lot of it can be outside of your control. Um, and so it gives you, I think, a really nice, for me anyways, it gives me a sense of power and control and yeah. confidence in my own progress. Do you think that you were accelerated in that sort of, you know, that, that internal growth of who you are and what you're supposed to do because you were in such a high performance setting as a teenager? Yes. I think that sport is like a microscope on real life. It's like it, it concentrates it, it narrows it down. I lived in a bubble world and mm -hmm. I learned everything out of necessity to be my best. And your best is monitored quite simply daily because every day you're showing up, it's very physical. It's a physical metaphor, right? So it's very easy to see if I'm living up to my potential or my best or my better than yesterday. And so every day that I wasn't better, there was an opportunity to learn. Well, what did I miss here? What can I do better? Yeah. And it makes you evaluate these things that are way outside of like a normal range of a 12 year old, right? Like I was traveling to competitions in Canada by myself at 12 years old. You learn a lot about yourself and the world and all of it, all of those things you learn is yeah. for the sole purpose of skating better. What's that, Carrie, carry this through now over the next few years. Did you have the same coach the whole time? Yeah. Yeah. She was oh. the coach that ended up taking me to the Olympics. Come on. Um, what, tell me about the, the trust that was necessary between the, the two of you. Like, what did that, you know, how was that defined? What did that look like? And how did you, how did that show up in, in like any given specific moment that you can remember that kind of um, demonstrates the, the trust in that relationship that you believe what she's saying and she sees the best in you, but me and she's going to push you and, and like, what was going on there? So that's just a, a big, like trusting Patty was just innate. You know, she, she was at, she has a force. She, that woman has never heard no in her life ever. <laughs> or she's never accepted no. There you know go. what I mean? Like that's, that's the type of woman that she is. And, and I was surrounded by that daily. Um, and so trusting her was just a part of the process. And I would say that when I started skating pairs, when I was 15, because that's, that's what I went to the Olympics in was pairs figure skating. Mm -hmm. Um, again, there's an, there's a decision. There's an innate trust. I have to trust this, this boy, this 17 year old boy to chuck me over his head and throw me across the ice and, and to have a connection with and, and to add icing to the cake, Patty, my coach and Rudy, and myself, we had no idea what we were doing. Patty had never coached pairs before. So like, we're literally teaching ourselves off of VHS and a TV and, and calling anybody in the surrounding areas that knew anything about skating pairs. And, and so I think that in itself created a really great foundation of trust that we were like, we're all in, we're all doing this and we're all gonna figure it out. Like we're moving forward. It was a commitment to moving forwards consistently. And then over time, you just spend so much time with someone 
you know, the trace, the trust is, it's just foundational. It just continued to grow. And, and that's, again, there's this really cool development already. Again, we're in the first, you know, 17 years of your life, but, but what I'm hearing in this story is there's at some point you said, I want to try this thing. And then this amazing trust for yourself seemed to show up first. Again, I'm 12 years old. I'm traveling by myself. Like there's a trust <laughs> belief in yourself, right? Oh yeah. Again, but that's, that's Patty and my parents that they, they're the people, Patty's my coach. They're the people yeah. that uh, opened that door for me to believe in myself and to challenge my, to challenge me to, to find that belief no matter what, because I couldn't, I couldn't want, they couldn't want it for me. And so in all of these ups and downs, they were showing me that like, I had to have the belief because they couldn't do it. And also you learn that quite early on when you're the only person standing on the ice in the dead silence, surrounded by hundreds of people waiting for your music to start. You're like, well, yeah, this is on me, right? Yeah, like I, yeah. I have to show up and yeah, was there it was just kind of fear. Yeah. You know, as I, I mean, <laughs> Alex, come on, softball. Um, like what, what, as I, let's go back. I, I want to jump ahead to the Olympics and, and everything, obviously, but I, I want to just clear, clear up, like, what's the barrier? What barriers did you feel as you were growing in this sport, in this passion, in this drive for you going forward? You're like, life is now about figure skating. Um, yeah. What was in the way of that? It seems like as long as you worked hard, it all came to you. Oh gosh. Thank you. I am glad that that's what I'm portraying because that's completely inaccurate. Um, <laughs> it, everything. What did I feel? What did I go through? Yeah. Absolutely. Every emotion in the book, like you, when you have one purpose every single day that you wake up, it's not all sunshine and roses. You know that you've had multiple different passions and careers in your life. Mm -hmm. Like the shit storm that comes with every single one of them is mm -hmm. what I was experiencing. Add on top of the fact that like I had to, I had to physically go and perform and compete. And in that moment, be my best, no matter how well I trained leading up to it. So there's also like a, a very small pinnacle of moments where everything had to come together. Um, and I would say that like, I could tell you about how amazing I was, but I'll tell you instead that I was a complete head case. <laughs> I had to learn these things again, out of a necessity of making yeah. so many mistakes and juggling all of these emotions incorrectly. And as I got higher and higher up in my career, I started working more consistently with a sports psychologist because I realized that if I wanted to continue getting to new levels, I had to figure out what the heck was going on in my head and how to control that because mm -hmm. that was going to be the thing that stopped me. See that, that's the stuff. Again, that's what just happened. That was, you know, let's read a chapter in a book and here's Paige and here's who she is. And then the next chapter is this exposition about what she's thinking during the exact, you know, the competition moment that we just read about. And it's the second chapter that, that really pulls us in. You know, that's, it's that it's, I could tell you about my successes, but no, I, this is what I had to struggle with. This is what I had to go through. That's where we find ourselves. Yeah. I think again, I learned so much at a young age that I bring into my coaching now that relate to growing adults. And I love that. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I learned through all of those mistakes, but I think really quite truly, um, there were so many things I did wrong throughout my skating career. Um, while at the same time doing a lot of things, right. And I ended my career after the Olympics, quite honestly, because my body was broken, um, mm -hmm. from overtraining and from having the wrong mentality of just more, more, more. It was very burnout driven in my training, um, as well as a terrible relationship with my partner because I was carrying a lot of adult themes in mm -hmm. a teenager's lifespan and having to work with somebody so closely for nine years while being completely different people. Like I didn't know how to deal with all of that. And, yeah. and the Olympics were a huge moment for me. It was the first competition that I ever allowed myself to just show up and compete as myself without trying to control everything or, or worry about my partner or, or anything like that. And it was very freeing. And, and that was a, it was a beautiful ending and start to the next chapter of my life. That doesn't seem like 
the way that people should talk about the Olympics. It's like you get there and it, and you would, I would imagine this is the most nervous you've ever felt. This is the most tight constricted you've ever felt in your life, because this is the moment that you've been working for, for nine years, like over 2,700 days, over 3000 days I'm doing this math. And yeah. you, <laughs> um, you work towards this and then you're there and and what you step up what you walk into the stadium carrying a flag what olympics was it 2014 and you walk you walk in the stadium sochi sochi russia and you're you're wearing you know your roots roots gear was it roots or was it the bay i don't know the bay. It was the bay. It was the bay. <laughs> <laughs> and you see the, the the crowd and you're with your team and everything and and in that moment you're not feeling tight and constricted and like i need to control this i need i better win for these people you're feeling this is oh, amazing. Yeah. yeah i mean opening ceremonies are amazing they're like a disassociation from anything else and i was a literal jaw dropping moment when i walked out like i realized about five seconds into us like walking around my my mouth was open i was like this is embarrassing Close your mouth. <laughs> um but that's <laughs> I, we saw I your photo that. on all the newspapers. Mouth open page. <laughs> uh. I would say that um, my career up until the Olympics was like everything, like the goal at the expense of myself, right? It was like I would do anything for going to the Olympics, mm. whether that be to the disadvantage. I mean, not anything. I never cheated. Um, but I would say, yeah, the expense of myself and my sense of my happiness and the expense of like, I, I mean, I sacrificed a lot and I right. loved it. It was all worth it. Don't get me wrong. But it, it was one big struggle. And at the Olympics, I skated for myself. It wasn't at the expense of myself. It was for myself. It was this very mm. freeing moment. And yes, it was very, um, you know, like everything you said, tense and, and like nerve wracking. And this is the moment and a lot of pressure. But one, that's a, that's a given, right? I've been working with my sports psych and my coach and Rudy for months leading up to the Olympics. Yeah. The Olympic year was the most stressful of my life. Like, so I, I had a plan. Um, but really it was in like moments before I, the music started, where I just gave myself permission to like enjoy this moment. Like our, our short program, I got off the ice and there's like, it's on YouTube, I believe. And you can see the first thing that I say when I hug my coach is that was so much fun. Like that was so much fun. And after our long program, I got off the ice and I was like, I just didn't want to stop curtsying. Like I didn't want to get off the ice. <laughs> Um, like the lady at the end of Sound of Music who just keeps <laughs> bowing, do you know? That's what happened, like... <laughs> yeah. Like even the commentators are like, oh, Paige is going to take one more bow. Wow, there she goes. Yep. <laughs> um, but it was it was like a, a decision, right? I, I had given so much to get there, both to like, well, yeah, just I'd given a lot to get there. Yeah. And I made the decision there early on that I wasn't going to let anybody steal from my moment. Um, and that's what I did. And this is, this is what's so amazing about this. And it's kind of what we talked about earlier. You know, I asked, you know, did, did he win? And like, I don't even know. Did he win the yak riding competition? I don't know. Like yeah. for you, you came, you ended up 14. 14. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Does it matter? No, because what you just said is the story. Yeah. What you just said to me about this Olympic experience is that I, all the way leading up to that, I was sacrificing myself. And when I stepped on that ice, I skated for myself and it changed everything. Things yeah. shifted. Completely. You know, it was like I say, it wasn't a perfect skate. We made mistakes, mm -hmm. but it was a perfect mm -hmm. moment. Like mm -hmm. moments I look back on, I can't help but smile as I talk about it because like, yeah. And it's just perfect. This and and a lot of people, you know, they look for that moment. 
when I, when I work with people and, and I'm like, okay, yeah. So, you know, who were you? And we just start to describe that. I'm like, okay, so now what's a moment that, that shifted things? We're like, I don't have the moment. I don't have the big moment. I don't have that Olympic people applauding for me moment. You literally have that. And people are, will compare themselves to you and be like, I don't have her story. And the thing is the story, again, it's not the podium moment. Yeah. It's the you hugging your coach and saying, that's fun. Mm -hmm. That was fun. That's the moment, which doesn't sound like a big explosive moment. And I think that's, what's so important about this is even in, even when there is the moment, Mm -hmm. it actually comes down to a moment, just a small moment um, that, 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 that connected something in your mind to say, success is going to look different from here on out. Well, and I think what really, I, I completely agree, but I think that word you just said, like connected, I think that's the power of those moments. Everyone has them if you choose to connect with them as you're moving through them, right? For better or for worse. Yeah. You don't need to go to the Olympics to have a big realization or to have one of those moments, but you do have to be present in it and you do have to be vulnerable enough to connect with this, be like, wow, this is big. This is a moment. This is something, this is a, a time that I'm choosing something. And I have tons of those. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I could fast forward three days after that, after that perfect moment, I'm dealing with a bunch of crap with my partner. And, and I literally at the, the highlight, the, the, in my mind, I'm never going to be higher in life than I am right now. This is the pinnacle of success. I have been worth it to get here, like all of it. And it's a heavy story but it won't be worth it if I do this for four more years. Like in that moment, the Olympics, I was like, if I go another four years to go to the Olympics, I would regret it. Like talk about. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's, that's a choice. A right. Um, okay. I'm just, I'm, I hear that. I'm time out here for a second. Um, Cause the video is lagging. The, ah. the voice is lagging a bit. Let me go off video. I think, I think that's what I'll do. Let's just shut off video and see what this does. So look at our smiling faces. Beautiful. Um, can we, can we go back a minute and can you say that again? You know, it was, it was a few days after that. I could fast forward a few days after that. Can you, yeah. can you yeah. tell that moment again? And we'll see if this is clearer sure. and then we'll go on from there. Um, yeah, I mean, like there's always moments, right. If you're willing to find them, I mean, fast forward three days, whatever, whatever it was, I'm still at the Olympics. I'm still at the, the highlight of my career and and my life, right. In my mind at 24 years old, this is the only purpose I've ever woken up to pursue. So it doesn't get any better than this in life. And I'm sitting in the athlete's lounge by myself and I, I realize everything had been worth it to get to that moment. Right. And there's like a lot of heavy shit in that, that period of kiddo to Olympian, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. everything had been worth it. I have zero regrets, but if I decided to go four more years to go to the next Olympics and did everything the same and continued living the way that I was, I realized that it, it wouldn't be worth it. And to me, that was like a very profound moment that I wasn't even sure what to do with at the time but I knew that I could never forget that moment because mm. I felt like it was a turning point. So again, it's just this, I'm sitting in the lounge moment mm-hmm. when, yeah. when a thought comes to you and you are connected to it enough and open to listening to yourself that you say, okay, yep, I understand. And something's going to change. So how does that, how does that play out? How does that now lead into, you know, this next chapter, or these, these next chapters, but specifically as you wind down your Olympic experience, what does that look like to leave that behind? Um, to, to leave that moment behind, I guess that moment, but also that, that, that life, yeah, like how, so do, how does be, that play out? How does that unfold? Yeah, yeah. To be completely honest, like went home, trained for two weeks, went to world. So it was like back to business as usual, despite yeah. this, like heavy thing hanging over at my head 
Um, and then, you know, it, it, it had been written in pencil prior that like we weren't doing well as a trio, the three of us. And so my coach said to take some time off and to think about what we wanted to do with our career and our lives. And we came back together and um, I was willing to make it work if, if we could make some changes, you know, like I, I was, I remember, remember that moment and essentially created some standards for myself. And at the end of the day, we just wanted different things and we couldn't reconcile them. And out of the blue, you know, four weeks after the best moment of my life, I mm -hmm. was retired. I had no partner. I had no plans. I had no purpose. Um, and <laughs> that was the beginning of a very tumultuous time in my life. Um, where I had to like redefine success, which is why, you know, I bring that into my coaching now because yeah. that was the beginning of this next chapter of like, who am I? What's my purpose? So, and, and as you sit here, unstoppable, mm -hmm. there's, it's again, it, unstoppable is, it sounds like that's, that's who you were like, you were this person who's, who saw a goal and you're like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to sacrifice everything to get this done. I am completely unstoppable in on this mission to get to Russia and skate on that ice and bow curtsy 14 times. <laughs> it's going to happen. <laughs> this is the thing. Right. But I, I, again, this is what I bring forward. What I discovered throughout all of that is I do love being you know, like I, I love the pursuit of a goal. I love that, that first half, or I would call it like 90% of being unstoppable. All of the, just like the, let's get the work done. I love showing up for that, mm -hmm. but I have to add in that at the moment for it to be the purest, bestest moment, I had to show up as authentically myself. And I had to allow myself to just like enjoy the moment. And now I realize that that's, that's the piece that was always missing. And I now want people to become unstoppable in reaching their goals while being authentically fulfilled in the pursuit of it. Ooh. There it is. <laughs> That's... You're like, finally, gosh, 45 minutes into it. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, right. No. Yes, but no, like that, that's, <laughs> of course, this is, but this is the journey, you know, let's go back to the book is like, yeah, uh, uh, finally 400 pages in, we get to, you know, the point of it all, not, but the, the where it is now, Yeah, this is the way that it works. And, and, but the way that you just define that, the way, the way that you just describe that, right. So you can show up now and say, I'm a high performance coach. Great. Fabulous. You open up that story of I've been doing this all my life. Like I've been, I've been working towards a goal. I've been unstoppable in my pursuit of success for most of my life. Then I reached that moment, brought in an ounce of authentically being me that was missing before that and mm -hmm. felt more alive and free and joy filled than ever before. Mm -hmm. That was the start of me shifting things to bring in more of that to the point where now I'm not going towards the Olympics, but I do have goals and I am exceptional at setting goals and sticking to them at, at preparing and executing and owning my vision. And now I'm doing it. It's not an ounce. It's not 10% of me. If it's, it's 50% of me and I can teach you to do the same because this is the way that we're designed to live. That's what yeah. I do. Yeah. And I would say it's not 50%. It's all of me. They, it's on. all of me in all of the areas. I love it. On a side note, can I just hire you to do my uh, speaking for me? That was beautiful. Yes, you can actually. Uh, okay, yeah, that, is, that is literally, <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not literally, but it is sure. Yeah. <laughs> for those also listening and wondering, uh, yeah, you could just email uh, alex at alexstreet.ca and um, <laughs> throw lots of money at me. Um, but, and and you know, you don't need me to, because you've got it. You, you, you have that, you have your own story. You, and, and the more that you just open it up like this and you can put these chapters to it and say, well, yeah, this is what it was 
This was the motivation growing up. Um, these were the people I needed around me and the trust that I was developing with others and, and that they were helping me develop within myself got me to this pinnacle moment, but have, um, they got me to that moment, but then they've, they've created who I am now. Yeah. And that, that's something that I think so many of us are looking for. Have you ever read that quote, Our Deepest Fear by Marianne Williamson or like- Oh, Williams? yes. Yeah. What's so interesting, it's like, that is my, like maybe my mission in life, that, that poem, quote, speech, whatever you want to call it. And it's interesting because a judge gave it to me, I don't know, three years out from the Olympics. She was like, I think you should read this. And I had it taped to my bedroom, my bathroom wall um, for the rest of my career. And it was like, I always aspired to, to be that, but I could never quite touch it, right? And then there's a line that I've really devoted my life to since then, since the Olympic moment, since being like authentically myself and all of that stuff, it says, um, your playing small does not serve the world. There's mm -hmm. nothing enlightened about shrinking so other people won't feel insecure around you. We were born to manifest the, the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. And I'm like, I think that's so beautiful, right? As we let our own light shine, we give other people the permission to do the same. Mm -hmm. That's like, that's it. That's showing up and owning who you are, being committed and passionate about your purpose, going after it with no holds, and by, by doing that, you inspire others to be like, oh my gosh, she's being herself and she's doing amazing, awesome things. But I can be myself and do amazing, awesome things. Like, I think that's, that's what I aspire to do. Mm. And it's, it, it just comes through so clearly. This is why there's so much joy to who you are. You know, we've, we've, we've built a friendship over the last couple of years uh, where there is trust and there is encouragement. And, and I, I trust you to, to help me value the process of the work that I do and, and set my goals and stick to them. And like, you know, this is how we talk to each other now. And it's just because I hear this and see this in you, that it's not about you, but if you were to all of a sudden shrink, then what good would you be? Like if you were yeah. to, to, yeah, to, to sacrifice yourself mm -hmm. again for this cause, well, yeah, you're at a point now where you realize that that's not actually the purpose. The purpose is for me to show up in my fullest. And I think that that, and that is not stealing anything from anybody else. There is an abundant life out there where there's enough room for you to play big and for me to play big. Yes. And as and we do that, I we encourage each other to, to play even bigger. Yeah, because what a bright little world it would be if we all played huh. big and showed up as our fullest. Okay, so for those that are uh, desperate to hear really like the ins and outs of this yak story, but more <laughs> importantly, would love to talk to you about this idea of becoming unshakable, um, of truly bringing all of yourself into all of your work something that maybe they have always wanted, but have never been able to put their finger on to, to never be able to, to actually experience, to live at their highest performance, um, ultimately to shift like you have shifted page. For those that are looking for that, how are they going to connect with you? What's the best way to get that conversation started? Follow me on Instagram, Paige Lawrence Coaching, and just send me a message. Like I, I, I love connecting with humans, whether it's about the story about the yak or it's about business, or if you just need like to ask a question, I, I love meeting and talking human to human. So reach out. And, and how do you do this? You have course, you have a course, you have actual, you have one-on-one -on -one coaching. Like what's the, what's your main process yeah. of, to, to move have, people through this? I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, is like the primary way of working with me. Um, I have a group coaching program that I am starting here soon. And um, I have a online course that I've partnered with a friend and fellow Olympian called the Podium Performance Program. Um, that is also an option as like an entry level step to change your life. 
you know, <laughs> just an entry level step to change everything. I love it. Um, it is it is so good. You are incredible. I am so thankful for your story, for um, the fact that it is not merely, uh, yeah, I got to the Olympics and this is what it was like, but there you brought us in to understand the depth of who Paige is and the people that you needed around you to get to the place that you are now um, able to show up as your fullest. And for that, I am so grateful uh, for, for that story. I'm grateful for the laughs and the friendship and for how this is going to serve my audience. So Thank you for your time. Thank you. I love the space that you've created here and how you are continuing to inspire people through their stories, um, as well as just by giving people permission to take a look at their own story and evaluate it and just show up more fully in, in the book that they're writing for themselves. Like you're doing important work here, Alex. So thank you for letting me be a part of it. Come on. It's just so kind back and forth. <laughs> Jeez. Okay. Let's end it there. Stop curtsying. <laughs> <laughs>